So for the last few years, I've been finding myself in kind of a weird place where I am constantly, simultaneously encouraged and discouraged by the truth that there is nothing new under the sun. All of the problems that we're facing today are all problems that previous generations have faced all the way back to the beginning of time. And on the one hand, that's discouraging because I feel like, why haven't we fixed these by now? <laughs> but it's also encouraging because we're not alone. We're not the first ones that have had to face these problems. We don't have to reinvent the wheel or come up with solutions because there are people who have gone before, ancestors of faith and wisdom who have experienced these problems and they can pass along to us how they dealt with it. For example, we are not the first Christian community to have to navigate a pandemic. In fact, it happened to Martin Luther, one of the people Anne Marie just name checked a moment ago, that not only did he spark the Protestant Reformation and, and fix the church, uh, almost single-handedly. About 10, 15 years after that, the bubonic plague struck out again in Germany, and the Christian community was in turmoil and was split back then too. How should they handle that? What is a Christian's response to a pandemic supposed to be? And so they asked Martin Luther, and he, he wrote it down. And if you're looking for some wisdom and some comfort in this season, I encourage you to Google it. Google Martin Luther and the plague, and you'll see, you'll find his 10-page treatise on it. I want to share with you today just one paragraph where he kind of summarizes everything that he said. But this was Martin Luther's advice to Christians during a pandemic 500 years ago. He said, the first thing is, therefore, you, you start with prayer. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. That's a Christian's responsibility. But from there, our Christian responsibility is that we should fumigate help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated, and thus perchance infect and pollute others, and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me, and I have done what he has expected of me, and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. But if my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy, and it does not tempt God. Now, I gotta confess, I'm a little smug and superior when I think about middle-aged people. I mean, they put leeches on themselves as like the height of medical treatment. But then I read stuff like this and I think, but man, I mean, this holds up today and I'm so grateful that Martin Luther cast this vision for what the Christian conversation should be about, that when we're trying to figure out how to navigate all of the dicey situations of a pandemic or a plague, that the conversation for Christians is not ultimately about what our rights are, but about what our neighbor's needs are. And if we let that drive us, then we'll, we'll navigate it successfully together. Because here's the thing, we, we have to do something, in fact, we are called to do something far more difficult than just survive a plague together. You see, we are called to rebuild this ministry. See, here's my conviction, and it's both my personal conviction and it's backed up by thousands of years of human history, and it is this, that Jesus Christ is the only hope for the world. There is no other means by which we human beings will be saved, and we, we see it over and over again. But not only that, that God in his infinite wisdom has decided that the primary method by which people find out about the hope in Jesus is the local church, which is bonkers if you think about it. Because I've been a part of a lot of churches in my 40 years of life, you maybe have too, and I can tell you that churches are filled with messy, broken, imperfect people and sometimes churches love and bless and serve each other, and sometimes people in churches tear each other down, wound and hurt each other. And yet in the midst of that messy reality is this reality, that every local church is an outpost of the kingdom of God. Every place where people of faith gather in community, we are an embassy in the midst of a war-torn nation that's filled with fear and hatred and despair. And the church is the place where those people can come to find protection, belonging, safety, and ultimately connection to the Lord of all life, the one who brings hope to the world. Which means you and I, we who are a part of this particular community of faith, we have a burden 
that we are called to rebuild this ministry even after a, a year and a half of things that have torn down, that have, that have made life hard, that, that have diminished the work that we do, we have to rebuild. But the good news is, the encouraging truth is, we're not the first people of faith that have had to rebuild after disaster. There is nothing new under the sun. This has happened before, and we today can learn lessons about what it looks like when the people of God rebuild, because we are called to be an outpost of his kingdom. We are called to be a city on a hill, shining light and hope to the world. And Nehemiah, who is a, um, a rebuilder of Jerusalem, has lived this out himself. So this is the story that we're going to be circling back to this week and all the weeks of this series. Dion Garrett talked about it a little bit last week. And so it started when Nehemiah returned to the city of Jerusalem, this, this, this capital city of God's people that had been torn down, that had been destroyed. He went back so that they could resume the ministry that it was intended to have. And now today we're going to look, like, look at what happens after you return and you begin the process of rebuilding. So we're gonna be in Nehemiah chapters two, three, and a little bit into four as well. So it starts, Nehemiah 2.11. So Nehemiah went to Jerusalem, he returned. That was last week. And after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one that I was riding on. It wasn't a big party. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gate, which had been destroyed by fire. And then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. So notice step one of a rebuilding process is you gotta get the lay of the land. He doesn't just jump in with hammers and mortar. He says, hang on, let's look at what we've got. Let's survey, let's understand and evaluate the scope of the problem. And I wanna show you a little bit of the scope of the problem so that you understand how daunting a task this is. This is a picture today of Hezekiah's wall. Uh, this is a modern day uh, excavation. Uh, so this is an uh, archeological dig. Uh, and this is the exact same wall that Nehemiah was rebuilding. And I wanna show you this for a couple of reasons. One, today it's kind of in the similar state as it would have been when Nehemiah was there. It's torn down, it's rubble. Uh, it's not anything like what it used to look like. I also wanna show you the scale. See, when I picture walls and rebuilding, I think of my house, right? You got some two by fours, some sheetrock, you know, a wall is not that big of a deal. The walls that Hezekiah built, the walls that Nehemiah is now rebuilding, were 22 feet thick, 25 feet high. They were huge, monstrous, and they were all torn down and in rubble. See, this is the picture that, that uh, was painted as Nehemiah went out by night and surveyed the city. He knew how daunting a task it was because he took the time to check first and to realize that this was not a task for the faint of heart. He needed to know full well what it was going to take to rebuild this particular wall in that particular time and place. And in the same way, we've uh, talked about this before, but I wanna, I wanna say it again. If you didn't know, our church leadership has spent the last year getting the lay of the land. Last summer through the fall, all of our church staff, many of our school staff leaders, our board of elders, our board of directors, we embarked on a journey of prayer, spiritual retreat, strategic planning, brainstorm, and collaborating together. It was a, a six month long process. And that was us getting everyone together in the same room, dreaming, evaluating, understanding what could be, what needed to be, what had been. And next week, you need to come back next week because Dion Garrett will be talking about all of the stuff that we imagined, all of the things that we thought our ministry could be. But this week I want to talk about the sober evaluation as we looked around at what had happened to our ministry over the course of COVID, what things needed to be rebuilt and fixed so that we could have future vision moving forward. See, we did the same thing Nehemiah did, which is that we took time and prayer and understanding to look at what needed to happen first, what needed to be fixed first. And so we did that, but Nehemiah didn't stop there. He kept going. 
So then he goes to the leaders of Jerusalem and he says to them, look, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. So this was last week. Remember, he's got a blank check from the king to rebuild this wall. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. A few things for us to note here before we go on any farther is a couple of things. One is, you know, he he called all the people in Jerusalem together and he said, the walls are torn down, the gates are burned. They'd been living there their whole lives. They knew the issue wasn't that they, that they knew what was going on, it was that they had settled for less than what Jerusalem was meant to be because none of them remembered what it had been. None of them had, been, had seen the glory days when the walls were 25 feet high, when Jerusalem was truly a, a beacon and a city on a hill. And it took Nehemiah as an outsider to come in and say, do you guys realize what you're living in? You're living in disgrace. But without his vision, they just settled for it. And they'd learned how to get by. See, you know how you live in a city where the walls are torn down? You don't build up anything. You don't have nice things. You don't have a, have a good house. Because Jerusalem was surrounded by marauders and bandits. And so the way that you protect yourself from marauders and bandits is you make sure you have nothing worth stealing. Nothing that someone might want to attack you for. They lived at this barest minimum level of subsistence, just saying, well, this is good enough. And Nehemiah came in and he said, no, guys, it was intended to be better than this. You weren't intended to live in disgrace. You weren't intended to live just scraping by. You were intended to have walls of protection, a place where you could have a house that you could call your own and and trust that you could live in safety and, and to have this life for yourself and for your family. Someone has to come along and remind them of what the vision could be and to point out how they've settled for less. And we have to do this today. I do this all the time. I have to do this with my kids. I tell my kids, guys, there were the glory days of 2010 when Netflix had everything. Every show and movie in one place. It was amazing, but they don't know. They're used to now where you have to have like nine subscription services because they all have different pieces of it, right? We have all these remotes on the table and only certain ones work for different things. And I say to them, guys, it didn't used to be this way. It was so nice, one remote, all the movies and shows you could want. We have to cast that vision, we have to remind them. Julie Lorenz and I, we run the Getting Started orientation here at our church, that's how we invite new people into our community. And it's been wonderful to see how even over the course of COVID, we've invited so many new people into this family of faith that have become a part of Pathfinder Church. But what's been really striking to me is the last six months, everyone in Getting Started has never experienced Pathfinder Church before COVID. They've only experienced it now. And they like what it is now. They they found us because we we stream online and and we do an excellent job. And we we were one of the first churches doing that as Anne Marie talked about. And, And they love our messages. They love the things that they get from this church, but they have no vision for when we had hundreds of children roaming our hallways on a Sunday morning. They don't know the thriving group ministry and all of the events, activities, and service projects we used to have going on, that the the preaching and the worship on, on the weekend was not our main thing that we did. It was one thing we did amongst many things. And so to rebuild, I have to cast this vision for you again. We, it, I'm so glad we've been able to do ministry the way we have over the last 18 months, but I don't want to settle for that. It's time to remember that a a local church can and should do more than just have a weekend worship. That we're called to be a beacon of hope to the world. We're called to invest and serve the lives of people in our community, children, adults, everyone, wherever they may be. This is the vision I have for us. This is the vision your leaders have for us. And so as we look at Nehemiah today, the rest of the time, I wanna start from this premise which is that your lives have rebuilding that need to happen in them. Your lives have been affected by COVID. Your your workplace is different, your relationships are different, your friendships, your activities, they're all different. And you are gonna have to go through the hard struggle of figuring out what it looks like to rebuild your life now after everything that's happened. And in the same way, we are called as a community to rebuild this ministry and to say what needs to get built back up so that we can continue to have vision 
for the hope of the world that God has called us to be. So with that in mind, this calling that, that your life needs to be rebuilt in one way or another, this ministry needs to be rebuilt, let's look at the story of Nehemiah, how he went about this process, and let's see what principles we can adapt from his own experience. So let's go to the story. So he's gotten the elders on board, they're excited, they're ready to rebuild, and so here we go. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests, they went to work, and they, and they rebuilt the sheep gate. And then they dedicated it, and they set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they also dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. And the men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. And then the fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hasanaa. They laid its beams, and they put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Then Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, he repaired the next section, and next to him, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, he made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Baana, also made repairs. And the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their, super, under their supervisors. And then he keeps going for another like 30 verses. And I'm stopping now because that's enough foreign sounding weird names for you in one, one section. So let me just show you visually, though, what he's describing. That in the entirety of chapter three, this, this somewhat tedious list of weird names, he's showing the, the completeness of the rebuild. And so notice where he started, and he's going around. So the first verse we saw that the, the Elias sheep and the priest, they rebuilt the sheep gate, and then the Tower of the Hundred, and they went all the way to the Tower of Hananel. And then from there, men of Jericho rebuilt the fish gate, and then he just goes all the way down the list, and he literally, in order, talks about every single section of the wall that's built, uh, finishing back around at the Sheep Gate. And just to give you some idea of the scale, the city of David was the ancient city where David um, originally lived. This is about, just this section right here, is about 12 and a half acres, which is almost exactly the size of Pathfinder Church campus, just to give you a, a vision. Our building, our parking lots, our soccer fields, 12 and a half acres. That's what that is. And then from there, they went all the way out to the Temple Mount and built that 2.5 miles of wall. 2.5 miles. And again, 22 feet thick, 25 feet high. That's a lot of work. And all too often when we're, when we're confronted with the, the scope of a task, it is so easy to quit before we even start. But I want you to note this first principle that Nehemiah did not do it alone. He didn't have a personal burden to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and say, well, I'm just gonna start laboring. He got all of these people to do it. 38 people mentioned by name, 42 different groups of people, not even people from Jerusalem, people from Jericho, people from Tekoa. These were outlying towns. He brought them together for a common vision. And here's the point for us to take away today, that many hands make light work. None of us are called to be lone gunmen, superheroes, doing it all by ourselves. We're called to be part of a team, doing one small piece of a bigger, larger rebuild. And I love this picture. I love how he went gate by gate, section of the wall by section of the wall, because the picture is one guy, one spot in front of him that he had to do. And right next to him, shoulder to shoulder, was another one working on his spot. And next to him was another group, and they were from their place, and they were working together. All of them together were able to take something so impossible, so huge, and make it manageable. And you'll see exactly how manageable they made it in just a moment. We don't do this alone. We do this together. The story goes on. But now, when Sanbalat, and he's a local official, when he heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. And then Nehemiah prayed, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, 
for the people worked with all their heart. Stephen Pressfield, a great author, says that the moment any of us try to do something great, there will always be resistance, always. If you're just trying to get healthy, there's gonna be resistance. You're trying to write a book, there's gonna be resistance. You try and, and do a new project, a new thing, resistance. Because anything that disrupts the status quo will be a threat to those outside who liked it just fine the way it was. Sanballat was perfectly wealthy, perfectly secure, with Jerusalem being in ruins. He didn't need another power agent on the scene. He didn't need a city that was fortified because that was a threat to his power and wealth. And I don't know about you, but I find also, often it's not even the external resistance that's the hardest for me to face. It's the internal resistance. Like, there aren't always as many voices out there telling me I'm foolish, but there are sure a lot of voices inside telling me that I'm wasting my time, that I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not gonna be able to see this through. But if we can push past that resistance, if we can recognize it for what it is, which is just the inevitable sabotage of anything that's going to disrupt the status quo, then we don't have to listen to it. We don't have to give it credibility. We don't have to think that it's right. We can just recognize it for what it is, people trying to protect their own current homeostasis. And then when we do that, just like the Israelites, we can rebuild the wall half its height in just a few days and weeks. So, just, so the principle is this, that we have to remember in the midst of anything that we're trying to do to, to resist the criticism because the criticism, it's so tempting to think that it's right and we're wrong to instead remember that the people doing the noble things, they're the ones that are striving, working hard, and the criticism is just a reaction to anything anyone has ever done that's worthwhile in the world. Don't let it label you, don't let it be your source of identity and trust. Put it where it is, which is just the natural consequence of trying to do something important. And then the story continues. All right, so the ridicule, the criticism, the, the words and the, and the threats weren't enough. So now, Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod, they heard that the, uh, that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls uh, had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very, very angry. So they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. But meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. See, once those initial criticisms are overcome, the resistance will always escalate. And so now it's not just empty words, now it's threats. Now, now they're actually saying that they're gonna harm you for trying to do this great thing. And you see the, the result is that the Israelites themselves, they get weary, they run out of energy, they don't know what to do. But in this moment of despair and giving out is one of my favorite pieces of this entire story. I want you to notice what the complaint was. They said, look, Jerusalem's been torn down so long, it's so destroyed that there is too much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. But here's the thing, I'm, I'm gonna tell you the spoiler. They do rebuild the wall, they rebuild it in 52 days. And it is so miraculous that the entire countryside is, is just floored. How could they possibly rebuild a wall in 52 days? And the answer is because of all that rubble. So you might not realize this, you saw that picture of the wall. You have one outside edge that's stone and masonry, and then 22 feet later you have another edge that's stone and masonry. Do you know what has to go in between those things? Rubble, dirt trash, all the stuff that you stuff in there because that's what provides the support, the strength, the stability of that wall. You've got rocks and masonry on the outside, you've got rubble on the inside. Theologian George Morrison points out that they didn't have to get a single new bit of stone material to rebuild this wall. They weren't building it from scratch, they didn't have to start with nothing, they started with something, all the rubble that was already there. So here's the principle that we need to take away from this moment, that often the very challenges we face are opportunities in disguise. And I've seen this in my life. Because in fact, both the greatest despair moments of my life and the greatest growth moments have come from the same place, which is that moment where everything I'm doing is proven insufficient. 
where I'm, I'm beating my head against the wall and nothing's working, nothing's working, and it's only in that moment when God says, yeah, so try something different. Stop doing the same old thing and expecting different results. Look for some lateral thinking. Stop trying to beat yourself up. And it's only in those moments the breakthrough has happened. The very challenge, the very thing that makes you just say, I'm, I'm burnt out, I'm done, I've got nothing left, is also the thing that lets you seek a solution from a different quarter. And the very rubble that made them lose hope was the actual secret to them rebuilding a wall in miraculously record time. So I encourage you in your own life, what are those things that, that feel like those challenges that, that are making it impossible to do what you need to do? And what, what can you learn? How can you use that to pivot and do something different to an even greater result than you ever might have imagined before? Story didn't end there. They kept going. But then also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them. And we will put an end to the work, right? So the, the, the ridicule didn't work, the threats didn't work. Now the enemies, the resistance is saying, now we're just gonna flat out attack you for this. And then the Jews who lived near them, they came and they told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. And when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. And from that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. And those who carried materials did their work with one hand and they held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. So I don't know if you caught this, they never actually had to fight a battle because they were prepared to fight the battle. And that was enough. And when we do big things, when we do projects, often we're going to be called to do something that we had not initially anticipated, it wasn't part of our original plan. And yet, just like these builders, they, there's an opportunity to do something new and important that's gonna contribute to the success of the project. One of my favorite moments is back at the beginning of the story that we read, where he talked about the very first group of builders, and who was it? It was the priests. And I love that moment, because the priests could very easily have said, it's not our job to build a wall. It's our job to run the church stuff. We do the sacrifices and the prayers and the incense. That's, that's, what we were, that's why I went to seminary for four years, was to do that stuff. But when the wall needs to be rebuilt, they jumped in and they built. They didn't talk about what, what, their, what their skill set was, what their passion was, what their vocation was. They just did the thing that needed doing. And in the same way then, these builders, these people that signed up to build a wall, they didn't say, well, I, I'm just a stonemason. I don't really know how to do this other stuff. They picked up a sword and they defended their families because that's what was needed in that moment of the project. And what I believe is that every one of us has to navigate both of these tensions, that you are, all of you, uniquely designed to do something specific in this world that God has given you talents and gifts and passion and that you should find those things and you should labor uh, in, in the direction and the field, the area that you were designed to labor in. But at the same time, there are moments where you just gotta jump in and fill in on the wall. Whether it's what you were meant to do, whether it's what you went to school to do, whether it's what you always planned on doing, this is just what the community needs and this is what we need to do together. The priests did that, the builders did that. And so what I've learned, and I think the principle from this is that, is that new skills for new situations come around. That we, even when we're trying to rebuild something old, we're gonna have to adapt, we're gonna have to be flexible, we're gonna have to find new ways to do old things, and that's exactly what we see in this story. And what I've learned myself is that when I'm put in those spots where I'm outside of my comfort zone, where I'm just doing what needs to be done, I've grown in unanticipated and wonderful ways. I've learned new passions I've developed new skills that stand me in good stead. And ultimately, they help me be more effective at whatever it is God's ultimately called me to do, both in the long term and the short. And so we as a community, this is something that we need to take away as well, is that, that we can't just rely on the old skills. We have to be willing to be flexible and adapt to the new situations as they arise. 
So these are the principles that we see in Nehemiah's story, but now it builds to the moment where, where I now need to ask you the question, what does this mean for you and me today? See, last week, Dion Garrett asked this, why go back? And if you haven't seen that one, I encourage you to go back and check it out. But in a nutshell, the answer is because a community of faith has never been a spectator sport. It needs all hands on deck. But this week, I want you to wrestle with this question. How can I help? And here's what I wanna say to you as you wrestle with this question this week. I promise you, every single man, woman, and child listening to me right now, you have an impact that God is calling you to make right now. I promise you that is true. There is no one sitting here, no one tuning in where God is saying to you, yeah, it's all right for you to just sit back and, and just kind of spectate as other stuff goes on. I promise you God is telling you that you have something to do. What I don't know, and it's ultimately for you to understand and decide for yourself, is how and where you're called to do that work. Maybe it's not here. If you're a guest, a visitor, if you're someone who's just passing through, then I hope that you will take these principles and you will humbly submit them to God and ask him where he wants you to invest, where he wants you to make an impact. If you've just been joining us for a few weeks and you're still getting the lay of the land, that's fine to just receive and listen, but be asking God where he wants you to plug in and make an impact. But if you are a part of this community, if Pathfinder Church is your home, if this is a place that you've invested and your, your children are here, you, your, your friends, your community is here, then I am telling you, we need you now. We need you to step up and be a part of this rebuilding process. Maybe continuing the ways you've already done, maybe new ways, but as you do it, I want you to, to think through these principles that we saw in this story to think about how we need to work together, where you can come together alongside side others. What are the things that, that are resisting and holding you back? What challenges are, are actually pivot moments for us to try and do something different and new? And, and what flexibility and adaptability is being called for us in this season? And so here's what I'll say. This is the insider part of the message. If, if you are a part of Pathfinder Church, then we need you to help us with this rebuilding process. For example, when I first came here, before COVID, we had this amazing kids ministry. We still have an amazing kids ministry, but it had 250 volunteers that were part of our uh, base group that made kids ministry happen every weekend. And now, after 18 months of all the strain and the difficulty, we have 100 volunteers still trying to do the same amount of ministry. And those 100 volunteers are working their butts off to love on our kids and to provide experiences for them to help them grow in their faith and in their life. But they need help. We need to get back up to that 250 number so that we can do the level of kids ministry that we are used to doing in this place. Or another example, our tithing giving units, the, the, the number of families and individuals who give here at our church that support us financially is down 12% from its peak before COVID hit. Now the people that are giving here are giving 8% more than they've ever done, but again, it's the same point. They're working harder than they've ever done before. We need to share that burden. We need more people coming alongside and helping. And so if you're wondering how, uh, how you can be a part of this rebuilding process, I encourage you to look through these questions because I'm telling you we need more volunteers in every area. We need more givers to support what we're doing. We need more people inviting so that people that are out there can experience the hope and grace of Jesus Christ in this place. This is part of our ask, part of the vision that we are casting for the next couple of years. But I wanna close with one really, really important note. I wanna talk about one kind of hidden aspect of the Nehemiah story that is the most important and relevant thing of this today. He and his crew built a 2.5 mile long wall, 22 feet thick, 25 feet wide, in 52 days. It was a miracle. But I wanna point out the one thing he didn't have to build was a foundation. See, part of the reason for that miracle was they weren't starting from scratch. The foundation of those walls already existed. All Nehemiah had to do was build on what was already there. And that was a hard work in and of itself, but he wasn't starting from nothing. He was starting from a foundation. And the prophet Isaiah, 100 years before Nehemiah went back, he made this prophecy about Jerusalem. He said, this is what the sovereign Lord says, look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. 
It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. And whoever believes need never be shaken. Isaiah wasn't talking about a literal brick. That wall that Nehemiah built, it got torn down again a few hundred years later. It got rebuilt again, torn down again, rebuilt, torn back down. The wall, while it was the most literal, immediate example, was not the thing God was prophesying. See, 500 years later, Jesus Christ would come to earth and he would say, guys, I'm that cornerstone. I'm the foundation of life. I'm the one that God was prophesying all those years ago. And even though Jerusalem gets torn down, I will not be. And the life that you build on me will always last. And maybe this is the first time you're hearing that. Maybe you just need this reminder. But here it is, that in your life, personally, individually, for us as a community, we always have a choice what foundation we build on. And if our foundation is, is success or wealth or a picture-perfect family, I promise you it will get taken away at some point in your life. But if your foundation is the rock of Jesus Christ, the one hope of the world, that cannot, will never be taken away. And I don't know where all of your personal lives are. Some of you have come through COVID and you're doing all right. Some of you maybe are thriving. Some of you, your life is in shambles. And maybe it'll take 150 years like it took for Jerusalem. I, I don't promise that it will happen overnight. What I promise is Jesus Christ will not leave your life in ruins. He will build something glorious and beautiful out of your life. And he has and will continue to build something glorious and beautiful out of this community that we will continue to be, and in fact, will expand. It is my belief and my confidence that we will continue to be a city on the hill the way Jerusalem no longer is, but that we will be the local church. We will be the outpost of God's kingdom. We will be the place where a hurting world can come and can find hope and mercy and a connection to the living God, the foundation that will never be torn down. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we put our hope and our trust in you. That much like Jerusalem, as they labored for so many years, wondering when you were going to rebuild, and then you finally sent Ezra and Nehemiah, your leaders, to build something beautiful and wonderful there, to make your impact on the world in that time and that place. Lord, I ask you to do the same mighty work here and now that in this time, in this place, that Pathfinder Church would be built on the foundation of the hope that comes in Jesus Christ, that we will be built on your rock so that we can be a steadfast place for others. And so Lord, right now, give us the confidence, the trust, the hope that comes only from you. Give us the boldness to rebuild what has been in this place and to cast our vision for what could be in even larger, greater, more aspirational ways. But in all of it, Lord, use that rebuilding to give us lives of meaning and purpose, to make this a place where imperfect people can come together and find a whole life built on you. We pray this trusting in your name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're really grateful that you're part of the online Pathfinder community. If you're new, you can find some helpful resources in the description below or by going to our website at pathfinderstl.org. While you're there, make sure you check out our message podcast. This is a great way for you to follow our weekend services whenever you're on the go. Now, as you leave today, you can help us extend our reach by hitting the like button or by sharing the service with someone that you know that might use it. And then finally, we just want you to know that wherever you are, we are here for you. Blessings on your week.